John Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. and welcome back before we get into the episode just want to let you know that this is the free version of the podcast and all that means is that we are way behind where i'm at in patreon so if you are loving this podcast and you need more john constantine in your life definitely go check us out at patreon.com slash planes trains and comic books and sign up for the hellblazer tier where you'll get access to the entire hellblazer library that i've recorded so far and also you get access to the exclusive episodes of the planes trains and comic books main podcast so if any of that sounds good to you, definitely go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up there. And with that out of the way, let's get into the issue. Today we have a special issue of Hellblazer. Uh, I know issue 63 was supposed to be next, but I looked up the reading order and apparently there was a Hellblazer special that came out in between issue 62 and 63. So the name of this issue is actually Hellblazer special number one. And I don't believe this has anything to do with previous stuff going on, so there's no need to do any catch-up. It's just kind of a cool one-shot. So, first things first, we got the cover here of Hellblazer special number one. We see the face of a man with red eyes who's kind of smiling like maybe he's going to hurt you or something. Uh, he's also got like rainbow-colored hair. And then uh, that hair kind of goes into the background, and we go below him, and we see some stained glass like you would find at a church. There's part of a statue of Jesus on the cross uh, with the nail through his hand on one side. And then on the very bottom, we see a young boy hitchhiking. And it looks like it's about to become dark as a car pulls up to him. And we see on the cover that this is written by Garth Ennis with art by Steve Dillon. And we start off on the first page with John Constantine in church. And at first you think maybe he's repenting or something. But then as he looks over at the pew next to him... He sees a man that has, seems to have smashed his head on the pew, and there is blood pouring out from him. And it looks like he's been sitting here for a while, because there's also a pile of cigarette butts next to John. And we see the name of this issue is called Confessional. So John stops looking at the man who's dead next to him, and he looks up at the crucifix hanging in front of him on the wall. And as he looks at it, he thinks, so I just snipped out for my 60 silk cut. Good thing, too, because I was going to be needing them the way things turned out. Then we get a panel of all his cigarette butts that are Silk Cut brand piled up next to the blood on the pew. And then we get a flashback of how John got to this situation. So we see a couple hours earlier, he's just walking out of his corner shop. And as he turns, he sees a man walking and his narration says, and there he was. And the man walking that he sees is the man who's dead in the pew next to him at the beginning. And he just looks like your average middle-aged to older man. He's kind of heavy set. He's got a walking cane, and his hair isn't gray, but he's definitely got the Friar Tuck thing going on where he's bald on top, and he's got some hair around the sides. And he also has a scar going down the right cheek of his face. And when John sees all of that, he all of a sudden kind of has a panic attack, and he goes into an alley, and he actually like curls down into a ball and holds himself for a second. He even starts to cry as he thinks about that man, and then he gets mad and says, Bastard! I'll get you, you bastard. And this was over the span of a couple seconds, so the man is still pretty close by. So John leaves the alley, and he begins to follow him. And his narration says, yeah, I'd get him. I wasn't some weedy kid anymore. And look at him. He had to be nearly 70 now. Oh, yeah, this time was going to be different. So John kind of stealthily follows the man, not wanting to alert him. And he watches the man go into a church. And then we cut inside as the man is praying and he's saying the Lord's Prayer as he looks up at the cross with Jesus staring down at him. And then he says, oh, Lord, I need tell me it isn't true. Make me free. Speak to me. And then John's voice behind him says, you little shit. And as the man turns, he sees John approach him from the side and he says, you, the, the boy from Liverpool, the hitchhiker, John, John. And John just dead face says, Constantine. Then as John stands there, we get a flashback that kind of fades from his face and goes down into the panels. And his narration starts saying, you know that old saying, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't really there. 
that nudge nudge wink wink allusion to all the hey like acid we took man and the groovy times we had well bollocks mate i was there and i remember the friggin 60s all right i remember october 1st 1969 like it was my first day in hell then we get a panel of a vw bus that's all red and it says love on the side and there's a flower painted on it and so this is obviously like a hippie bus. And we cut inside and we see that a very young John Constantine with really long hair is in between two ladies. And they're all naked and they're all undercover. So it seems that they've just had sex. And John is also acting like he's just had his mind blown because he's saying out loud, Jesus. And then he sits up and he begins to light a joint. And one of the girls says, can I have some of that? And as he passes the joint back and forth between him and the women, and they seem like they're very much into him. They're kind of kissing each other and playing with him as they do this. The narration says, Alice and Lynn had dropped out of UCLA to see the world in their little VW. They picked me up in Brum on our way south. Your like accent is just like Paul McCartney's. Yeah, love, he's my cousin. I was in like Flynn. We'd stopped for the night outside Oxford two nights before. Vodka, shitty elderberry wine, Acapulco gold and far too many Dexies. Tough old life. Then we see John and the women standing outside of the VW van and they're all dressed now. And one of the women is saying, we gotta turn off for Reading here, John, sorry. And John replies, it's okay, love. London's only 40 miles down the road. Be plenty more lifts like. And then the other girl pulls out something from her pocket and we see it is a little pouch with a mirror and a razor blade. And the little pouch obviously has cocaine in it, I guess. And she says, I forgot we had this stuff. You guys want some? And John answers, yeah, it'll keep me going. So the girl hands the stuff to John and she says, good luck making your fortune in London. And as John snorts the cocaine, he says, place won't know what hit it. And then I believe, although it doesn't show it, that John takes the cocaine paraphernalia, so the razor blade and the mirror and everything, and he puts that in his pocket because later on it comes into play. So as John walks away, one of the girls says, don't forget to send us Paul's autograph. And John looks at her with a smile and says, I promise. Then he waves as the girls drive away and the narration says, okay, I know, dirty trick. What'd you expect for Christ's sake? And then we cut to a little while later while he's walking on the side of the road and the narration continues. But London, yeah, that's where it was gonna all start happening. Liverpool and dad and all the little minds were behind me. I was heading south to set the world on fire. Then we see a young John say out loud as he walks, nice day for it. But as we turn the page, we see in the nighttime, it began raining. So now John is walking in the rain and he says, bollocks. And the narration says, but that's life, isn't it? Ups and downs, swings and roundabouts, looking around corners for whatever turns up. You play the card you're dealt. And the way I saw it, I had me youth, the old Constantine charm, and a new life in London and a little magic on top of it. Royal flush couple laces up my sleeve and all so as the young john is walking we see that a car is coming behind him and he puts out his thumb to pull over and the man does and john says freaking brilliant maybe it'll be hendrix and a bunch of swedish nymphettes so john happily walks over to the car on the passenger side and the window rolls down and the driver says where are you going lad and john answers london all right and the man says it is so john gets in the car and they drive away so we cut to the inside of the car as they're driving, and the man introduces himself, Philip Tolly. And John replies, John Constantine. And the man asks, that's a Liverpool accent I hear? And John replies, yeah. Do you mind if I smoke like? And Philip replies, not at all. Have you just left home? Oh, and I should probably say that the man who's driving, Philip Tolly, is a younger version of the man who was dead in the church, which you probably guessed, but I just forgot to say it. So John answers the question that Philip asked about him just leaving home. And John says, yeah, bored up there, you know, you want one? And John offers Philip a cigarette and Philip says, oh no, you go on. I hope you've got someone to stay with in London, son. I see a lot of young lads like you moving down, expecting there to be the world. And, and John cuts him off answering, yeah, I know the streets aren't paved with gold and that. Me make Gaz move down in the summer. He's got a flat. And Philip asks, oh, he'll be meeting you, will he? And John replies, nah, nah. Just told him I'd be down sometime before Christmas, like, soon as I got the cash together. And then Philip asked a super creepy question, saying, so you're not expected, right? And John, just not thinking anything of it, says, nah. Then we cut to them driving still a little while later, and the narration says, half an hour later, I was thinking, you know, decent old bloke, a bit boring. How far to go now? 
I'm going to surprise the shit out of Gaz. I wonder if he's got some smoke in it. And as the car drives, we see the little bubble outside of Philip talking, and we see what John was talking about with the boringness, because he's saying, I mean, a lot of people poo-poo Norwegian wine, but I think that's where the future lies. Then we cut to a shot of John looking out the window, and the man is just continuing this conversation about wine, and then in the middle of it he says, I want to suck you. Yes, Chateau du Ford. That's what you want. There's money to be made. So John, who wasn't really paying attention to this stupid, boring talk about wine, all of a sudden kind of gives a, wait a second, what did I just hear? Look. And he says, hold on. What'd you just say like? And Philip says, 20 quid a case. And then John says, before that. And Philip answers, I want to suck you. And then he just keeps driving and smiling like nothing weird happened. <laughs> and this is obviously before John has gone through all this hardship in his life for the most part. So he's still kind of happy-go-lucky and naive, and at first he can't really believe what he's heard, and he looks kind of dumbfounded, but then his face gets kind of hardened, and he says, yeah, right, stop the car, bollocks. But Philip doesn't do anything, he just continues driving and smiling, so John gets mad and he says, I said stop the freaking car, right? But Philip doesn't really pay any attention to that, he actually just keeps pushing the gas pedal down more, and we see their speed rising, and it's almost going over 70 miles an hour. And keep in mind, it is all rainy and dark outside. So John gets very alarmed at this and he yells out, What the bloody hell are you doing? Stop for God's sake, you'll kill us! And we see now the car is going over 80 miles an hour. And then the car actually takes a sharp turn and it actually slips off the road and hits part of a rock wall. But Philip is able to correct it and it's back on the road. And he says, That could have been nasty. And then he looks over at John very creepily and says, It won't be that bad, son. And then John, who's, you know, pretty scared and he's young and he doesn't know what to do like he would when he's older. So he begins to cry and he just says, okay. So Philip pulls the car over to a stop and he says, there, there, you won't try to run away now, will you? You're just a boy and I'm much stronger than you are. Of course you won't. And we see John is just staring forward, like trying not to acknowledge anything that's going on. He is crying, and very creepily, Philip wipes one of the tears away from his face, and then Philip leans down and puts his head in John's lap, but before anything really starts, John knees him in the face, yelling, bastard! And apparently John kneed him really good in the face, because as the man pulls back, he screams out, ah! And blood is pouring from his mouth and what looks like his nose. But we're only getting part of his face. We're only seeing the left side of his face that actually looks okay, but the right side that we can't see seems to be spurting blood and where most of the damage was done. And John is kind of horrified at first because he did not expect that reaction from just the knee in the face, but he does take advantage of this and he opens the door and is able to run away from the car. And as he's running, his narration says, why was there so much blood? That's all I could think of. Not some wanker just tried to suck me dick or I'm stranded miles from nowhere without me gear. Why so much blood? You don't bleed like that when you bite your lip or break your nose or even sever your tongue. So as John's running, he slips because it's raining, of course, and he's running on grass. So he falls down and he's on his hands and knees. And once he is there, he begins to vomit. And as he finishes throwing up, all of a sudden someone says, son. And as John hears this, he gets super scared and his eye gets really big. And then he slowly looks over to where the person was talking. And he sees, in fact, it is not Philip. It is a police officer. Then we cut to the police car driving away, and we see John is inside of it, and the narration says, They don't believe a word of it. They brought me along anyway. What the hell? They could always do me for wasting police time. So like John said, the policemen don't believe his story, but they are still driving around the area, I guess for show. And John is saying to them, I swear to God, mate, just around this next bend, like. And one of the cops says, It better be. And then John's narration says, It was starting to sink in, too. He was probably long gone patched up his cut lip or whatever, and driven off never to be seen again, like he probably had loads of times before, leaving me right the way up shit creek. But then, just like John said, as the police go around a bend, they see that the guy's car is actually still there, and it hasn't moved. And John looks down, kind of scared when he sees the car, and the narration says, On reflection, I wish he had. So the police car stops in front of Philip's car, and the lights are on and everything, so obviously if Philip is there, he's aware. And the passenger policeman gets out of the police car and begins to walk towards Philip's car. And he says to the driver, you keep your eye on him, meaning John, because I guess they still don't believe him and they're still not very trusting of him at all. 
So we get four panels in a row showing the walk of the policeman towards Philip's car. And when he approaches the side door and looks in the window, the policeman yells out, ah, and John and the policeman driver look at each other. And the driver says, um, better, uh, go. And so the driver gets out of the car and John also gets out and follows behind him. And as they walk over to Philip's car, the narration says later on after the 10 mile trip to London, when I screamed the whole way, I began to think about how normal he'd seemed. And I knew then the magic I wanted was not an abstract, ethereal thing to be picked up and dropped whenever I felt like it. That it's the real energy of emotion and life that runs around and in and out of us. That it's in our hearts and minds. And that hell is everywhere. And that the devil sits right beside us. So as John approaches the car, he sees Philip through the glass. And we get a full page spread of what has happened to Philip, why he was bleeding so much. And what happened was the razor blade that John had in his pocket from doing the cocaine is lodged deep within the right side of Philip's face. And this happened when John need him when he was trying to molest John earlier. Then we cut back to the moment where John had just spoke to Philip in the church right before we started the flashback. And as John stares at Philip, Philip looks kind of guilty. And he says, I came here tonight to talk to my God. I think for the first time in my life, my mind is clear and my thoughts are lucid. I know exactly what to say and what to ask of him. But for the first time in my life, I know he isn't listening. Will you? And this is crazy that he would ask John to hear his confession, basically. But John is a much older man who's much more jaded. So he goes to the pew in front of Philip and he sits down off to Philip's left. And then he lights a cigarette and says, everything. And then as John waits for him to start, we get some narration that says, never is enough, is it? Curiosity killed the cat, and it's almost done me in a couple of times and all, but I can never just face these friggers. I grasp inside them, up to the elbows and minds that slop with mad dog shit. I want to know. I want to see for myself. And even when it's way too deep and maybe it gets a little like a mirror, it's never enough. And Philip begins his confessional saying, If I... I'm telling you this because if only you can understand. It seems like he's kind of pleading to John here, but John doesn't turn around or say anything. So Philip looks down in shame and begins to rub his head and he says, I was a priest. Then we get a flashback of Philip when he was younger, just before the time when he tried to molest John. And we see him giving a sermon in priest robe. So he's got the, like the purple sash over his white gown. And I didn't really describe him before his younger version, but he's basically looks exactly the same, except he doesn't have a scar on his face and he's not balding, but he's still kind of heavy set. He just has a little less wrinkles. So as he stands at the pulpit, his narration says, the 1960s were not the best times to be a man of God. I think that was the very heart of the problem. I would look out of my flock and what I saw filled my heart with sadness. And then we see a shot from behind him that faces out towards the congregation. And we see the pews are pretty empty. There's only a couple old people sitting in the church. And the narration continues. Where were the children, the young people? Why were the guardians of our future not listening to the word of the Lord? Because I was preaching against indulgence and irreligion in a time where they were most definitely very fashionable indeed. Hope was dying inside me. My faith was hurt with a cancer eating at its core, and I became bitter, and the confessional became an anvil, where I hammered that bitterness to a white-hot hissing rage. And we get a panel of him looking at disdain as someone enters the confessional booth, and then Philip goes to sit down on the priest side of the confessional booth. And the narration continues. To be told from an early age that you are a sinner, to believe that you have done wrong and that you do so every day in the eyes of the Lord, that is the essence of guilt. In the Catholic Church, we have honed it to a fine art. For a few impressionable souls, even in a liberal age, it is a difficult thing to forget. So the confession starts and we see the young man saying to him, Uh, I'm a bit, I feel, you know, confused at the minute. And Philip just says loudly, No. And the young man replies, Uh, sorry? And Philip explains, You must begin, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Then you must tell me how long it's been since your last confession. Then you may confess your sins. And the young man says, Oh, um, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I haven't confessed in, in a few years, I suppose. I was at this party the other night, and one of me mates, like, we've known each other since we were nippers. Then we cut away from what the young man is saying back to the narration of Philip, who's listening, and it's saying, It transpired that under the influence of cannabis and LSD, they had made what he chose to call love. And he wasn't sure what to feel about it. 
Fighting back anger and nausea, I gave him 10 Our Fathers and 10 Hail Marys. Then I telephoned his father and the local police station. A judge gave him a six-month suspended sentence. His father broke his jaw, his arm, and six of his ribs. And in the panel under this narration, we see Philip looking rather pleased with himself, smiling at breakfast the next day, and the narration continues. I can recall no regret whatsoever at having betrayed the seal of the confessional. The young were turning away from the church. Desperate times, desperate measures. Then we cut to a little while later while he's at church and he's looking at a woman and she is about to give confessional and the narration continues. It was a long time before I realized that I was satisfying not the Lord's will, but my own. And it went on. I waited patiently while the world turned upside down and every once in a while, through a twinge of guilt or nagging anxiety, they were delivered into my judgment. Then we see him listening to another woman during confessional and his narration continues. I listened to the evil of the love generation, a licentiousness that filled me with hate. My punishments were delivered by parents and constabulary, requiring nothing from me but a careful word, a solicitous phone call, until one evening a young woman came to confess her sins to God. She informed me that she'd attended an orgy two nights previously, where alcohol and narcotics had dissolved all inhibition, and at the height of it she told me with a barely stifled giggle that she had found herself in the arms of her younger brother. Then we cut to the woman saying, I mean, like, he probably feels worse about it than I do, you know? Father? And we see as she's asking Father Philip, he is leaving his side of the confessional, and he bursts into her side, and he grabs her by the hair, and she yells out, Ah, Father! And he punches her in the face and says, Harlot! And as she falls down to the ground with a bloody nose, Philip goes and reaches down to hit her again, and then someone behind him laughs, saying, Huh. And Philip stops his attack and turns around to see a dapper looking man who's staring up at the crucifix. And as Philip approaches him, we get to see him from the side that Philip can't see. And we have definitely seen this face before. It is the face of the first. And as Philip approaches, he asks, can I help you? And without looking at him, the first just says, do you know he's coming back? And Philip's kind of taken aback by this. And he says, what? And the first continues, oh, yes. He'll be born in South Central Los Angeles this time. He'll run with the 80 trade gangsters until he realizes who he is. After that, he'll work tirelessly for the peaceful advancement of African American culture. He'll end up leading a green anarchist coalition in Hell's Kitchen. And a man named Geldof will kiss him on the cheek before an NYPD SWAT team. Just like the last time, neither religious establishment nor the government will believe him. And he, in return will once again misidentify the primary motivating factor of humanity as love. And of course, just like last time, he'll leave things in a much worse mess than he found them. All the same, he'll look pretty good up there with dreadlocks and a Fender Stratocaster, won't he? And you can tell the first is getting a lot of enjoyment just messing with Father Philip. And Father Philip asks, what, what are you talking about? Who are you? And the first replies, you don't know? And then motioning to the crucifix, he says, your friend there was fond of telling me to get behind him. You know who I am, Father Tolly. And then Father Tolly falls to his knees and holds his head, saying, Oh no! Oh, Father, protect me! I am your servant, Father! This is your house! Father, why? And the first just stands there and watches this with a smile on his face, and he says, Yes, he does tend to move in mysterious ways, doesn't he? That's part of why I'm here. Come on, Father Tolly. That won't do at all. Get up. And then he walks over to Father Tully and he puts his hand under his chin and makes him look up at him from the ground. And he says, I'm not going to hurt you, Father Tully, but I wanted to ask you a question. All these confessions you've been taking recently, the teenagers, you know, what happened to them? I already have a fair idea, but I'd like to hear it from you. And Father Tully replies, I, I don't understand. And the first answers, it's quite simple, Father. Apart from the young woman whose nose you've just broken, I'd like to know what's happened to these people since you've taken their confession. And the father thinks worriedly for a second and he says, Well, uh, well, two or three of them are in Barstow. Kathy Dabble left home. Stephen Rogers is in hospital and... And then the first cuts him off asking, The Peterson boy? And Father Tolly looks away in shame and he says, The Peterson boy, after he went to prison, after he, uh... After he was buggered 11 times in his first night, he killed himself. And then the first interjects, No, he didn't, Father. He tried, but a three-story drop wasn't quite enough. He breathed through a machine. 
He drools a lot and shits himself every five minutes. And then the father stands up and tries to argue, saying, I was, I wanted to save them. But the first isn't buying it, and he says, From me? What would I want with a bunch of hippie layabouts who smoke too much dope and screw all the time? No, father. What I want are total bastards. And when he says this, the first points directly at Father Tolly. And then he walks over to him and puts an arm over his shoulder, and they begin to walk, and the first continues. Come on then, father. You're fond of taking confessions. I have one for you. So we cut to the first giving confession, and he begins saying, Sitting comfortably? Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's my first confession. And then we cut away as he smiles evilly, and we just get a wordless panel of the confessional booth as the first confesses whatever horrible thing he did. And as we turn the page, we see the next thing that happens is the father breaks through the door, running away, yelling, Ah! Ah, no! Deceit! Oh, vile deceit! Empire of lies! Infamy! Oh, I know now! I know! And he runs from the booth, and he beelines straight for the giant crucifix on the wall, and he even knocks over a bowl of holy water as he does this. And then he stands in front of the giant crucifix with Jesus staring over him, and he yells out, he told me all of it. Oh, yes, I know now. I know who the Lord of Lies truly is. I know what hides beneath that steely gaze, that all-seeing, all-knowing face of stone. And then Father Tolly runs over to the bottom of the cross, and he grabs it, and with all his might, he begins to pull it off the wall. And it breaks free with him saying, it, it wasn't for our sins, not for ours. And then he throws the crucifix on the ground, shattering it into a bunch of pieces. And then he takes the bowl of holy water on the ground, and he begins smashing what's left of the pieces of Jesus on the ground. Then we cut to him pouring gasoline all over the church and lighting it on fire. And once the whole church is blazing, he falls to his knees and he begins weeping and wailing. Then we cut to the old father, Tolly, who's giving his confession to John, and he's saying, I got out. There began a period in which I was a little unclear. I think that, well, despite some of the things I did, that my manner had changed. My anger, bitterness, frustration, it was gone. And with it went that petty spite that made me betray those children's trust. And under this narration, we're getting a flashback of the father after he burned the church. And just like he said, instead of him being frustrated and bitter and angry with people, we see him actually smiling as he puts a pillow over a person's face. It looks like a young boy and the narration continues. I was kind, gentle, and compassionate, and most of all, I was understanding. I was a better priest. So basically, now instead of just getting angry and taking confessions, he is going around and he's killing young boys. Then we cut back to his confession with John and he says, I traveled up and down the country for two years. Exactly what gospel it was I preached, I am uncertain. But I know I brought peace to several troubled souls along my way. The last of them was in Scotland. Then we cut to the time he's talking about where he was in Scotland and he's standing in a lake and he is pushing a woman's head underwater and he has a giant smile on his face as it looks like the person is struggling pretty hard and the narration says, I baptized unborn twins in Loch Lamond. On a night so beautiful you could have drowned in starlight. I looked down at myself so happy I had found peace at last and I decided to head south. In the panel under that last narration, we see he's looking down at his reflection in the water, but just below his reflection is the face of the dead woman that he just drowned. And also, if you picked up on it, she was pregnant with twins, so he killed them as well. So after he said he decided to head south, he says to Constantine, that was when I met you. Did you wonder what happened to me afterwards? And John, still staring forward, says, for a while, I reckon they stuck you in some rubber room for the rest of your life. I was hoping you got ECT every night. But I've had worse shit happen to me since. I've more or less forgot about you until tonight. And then Father Tolly says, You were right. I was kept in a mental institution for nearly a quarter of a century. They didn't know what I'd done to the others, but what I'd done to you and the fact that I was catatonic was enough for them. The world ceased to have any meaning for me. I lived in silence, shackled to the wall for fear of a frenzy that would never come. But that was all right. I was never short of company. Every night he came to me and reminded me of what he said in the confessional. And for over 20 years, he kept me thousands of miles from my own sanity. So under these panels, we're seeing him in a padded cell tied to the room with a straitjacket on. And next to him is sitting the first who has been talking to him incessantly over the last 25 years. Then Father Tolly says, 
About a year ago, he showed up and suddenly everything was different. And we see the first is standing in Father Tolly's padded cell. And this time he looks more like we've seen him before, like when he first met Constantine and his hair is slicked back and he's got a ponytail. And he still looks very dapper, but it's like modern day clothes for the 90s. And he says to Father Tolly, it's over, Father. You're cured. And then he vanishes and the father is left there saying, uh, hello, nurse? And then we cut back to the confessional with John and Father Tolly is saying, and I was cured. Enough for the doctors anyway. Oh, it took a year for them to be sure, but they'd no money left to spend on me. Mental health is not the priority it once was. I was released this afternoon. I, I haven't forgotten his confession or what it made me do, but somehow the perspective has changed. That's why I came here to, to, to ask. And then John cuts him off saying, which really just leaves one question, doesn't it? And then John finally turns around and looks at Father Tolly and he asks, what was his confession? And then Father Tolly looks very hesitant and he begins to cry. And then he tells John what the first confessed to him and we don't hear any of it. And once the confession is over, John's narration says, and then he puts a pencil in each eye and he headbutts the pew in front of him. And this is exactly where we started, where John is sitting and there's a puddle of blood next to him because the father has bled out onto John's pew. And John stands up and his narration says, he let you go because he knew you'd be running into me. He knew whatever he told you was so awful you could never repeat it, but you wouldn't need to. You were a message, Tolly. One day soon, he'll catch up with me and pay me what he owes me. And then just before I die, I'll hear the devil's confession too. And then John tosses his cigarette into the pool of blood on the pew and he walks out of the church. And that is the end of the issue. And it seems like the first is trying out some psychological warfare on John, either trying to just make him mad or trying to make him slip up, or maybe just trying to make John scared. But either way, we will have to find out in the next issue, which is issue 63. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And we will see y'all in the next one.